question is, well, should you turn into a monster? And the answer to that is, yes, you should. But you should do it voluntarily. You shouldn't try to win. You don't want to be too aggressive. You don't want to be too assertive. You want to take a back seat and all of that. It's like, no, wrong. You should be a monster, an absolute monster. And then you should learn how to control it. He pulled open the door and there was a guy standing there ready to fight. And he kicked him underneath the chin with his steel toe cowboy boot, knocked him mm. right over the the front porch and the, you know, and the battle was on. What it means is this, those who have swords and know how to use them, but keep them sheathed will inherit the world. And so like one of the things I tell young men, well, and young women as well, but the young men really need to hear this more, I think, is that you should be a monster. You know, because everyone says, well, you should be harmless, virtuous. You shouldn't do anyone any harm. You should sheath your competitive instinct. You shouldn't try to win. You don't want to be too aggressive. You don't want to be too assertive. You want to take a back seat and all of that. It's like, no, wrong. You should be a monster, an absolute monster. And then you should learn how to control it. Do you know the expression, it's better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war? Right, right, exactly. That's exactly it. The way that you keep the psychopaths at bay is to develop the inner psychopath so that you know one when you see one. Right, and then, but that's a voluntary thing. It's, 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 so it's like, a, it's like a, a set of tools that you have at your disposal, which is full knowledge of evil. And that does, Nietzsche said, if you look into an abyss for too long, you risk having the abyss gaze back into you, right? The idea is that if you look at something monstrous, you have a tendency to turn into a monster. And people are often very afraid of looking at monstrous things exactly for that reason. And then the question is, well, should you turn into a monster? And the answer to that is, yes, you should. But you should do it voluntarily and not accidentally. And you should do it with the good in mind, rather than falling prey to it by possession, essentially. So I have a friend, he's a really good friend of mine, and I've known him since I was in college. And he's a tough guy. I mean, he grew up in a, a, under rather poverty-stricken circumstances in northern Alberta, really on a frontier piece of land, like it had only been broken 50 years before by his father, who was a longshoreman and an ex-military guy. Good guy, right. his father. But this guy gr grew up and he is tough. He worked in lead smelters and he wandered around Western Canada. And he was my roommate when I went to college and is still a good friend of mine. And he ended up working with like delinquents. He went into social work, oddly enough, and he ended up working with some of the worst delinquents in, in Canada. And he's a really good guy, and he likes to help people get better. But he isn't naive at all. And then yeah. part of the reason that he was good at working with the delinquents was because there were no tricks they could get up to that he couldn't see right through. And that was partly because he had a real integrated shadow. I mean, I'll give you an example of him. <laughs> so one day, and I was living in this town called Grand Prairie, and it was at the height of the oil boom. And so... It was a rough town and there were lots of rough bars in it and lots of young men in there with plenty of money and plenty of, they come in for, th you know, three days after being out in minus 40 weather working right. on the oil rigs and they were ready to party, man. And we had a party one night in this kind of frat house that I went to college in and about, oh, way too many people showed up and some of them were real troublemakers. And one, we had a table that was pretty full of beer bottles and vodka bottles and so forth. And one guy just went over, and like tore the leg off and knocked the table over and, then a bunch of us got together and chased them all out. And this friend of mine, he said, oh, they'll be back. And so he went upstairs and he put on some steel-toed cowboy boots. It was just like a bloody western. He came marching down the stairs. And just as he entered the living room, there was a big knock on the front door. It was these hooligans coming back to cause grief. And he, he just didn't break stride. He opened the door. He pulled open the door and there was a guy standing there ready to fight. And he kicked him underneath the chin with his steel-toed cowboy boot, knocked him mm. right over the the front porch and the, you know, and the battle was on, but that was exactly what he was like, you know, and he had, his shadow was integrated. You could, tr he was a great roommate. He, yeah. he reciprocated everything. I always knew if I bought groceries one week, he'd buy it the next. Like he was a straight yeah. shooter. You could trust him. He was not naive, man. And that made him able to deal with delinquents and to help them. So that's part of that integration of that shadow. Another client I worked with was having a hard time putting his kid to bed at night. And so we, we did the arithmetic. It's like, well, I'm fighting with my kid for 45 minutes a night trying to get him to go to bed. Okay, so let, let's analyze that. All right, so what does that mean? Well, it means that both of you end the day upset. That's not so good, because why would you want that? It means that you're spending 45 minutes fighting when you could spend 20 minutes doing something positive, like reading to him, say. It means that 
you don't get to spend that time with your wife, so she's not very happy with you, plus you're annoyed because you don't see her, plus you blame it on the kid because he's the proximal cause. It's like, that's pretty damn ugly. And then, and then let's do the arithmetic. It's like seven days a week, 45 minutes a day. Let's call that five hours, 20 hours a week, 240 hours in a year. It's six. You're spending a month and a half of work weeks fighting with your four-year-old son. You think you're going to like him? You don't like anyone you spend a month and a half a year fighting with. It's a bad idea. Fix it. It's important. Get him to bed. Make it peaceful. Your life isn't margaritas on a beach in, in Jamaica. That happens now and then. Those are exceptions. Your life is how your wife greets you at the door when you come home every day. Because that's like 10 minutes a day. Your life is how you treat each other over the breakfast table. Because that's an hour and a half or an hour every single day. You get those mundane things right, those things you do every day. You concentrate on them and you make them pristine. It's like you got 80% of your life put together. These little things that are right in front of us, they're not little. That's the first thing. They are not little and they're hard to set right. And if you set them right, it has a rippling effect and, and fast too, way faster than people think. That's the way. Obviously, what's the way out of tribalism? First, the way out of tribalism is not to never join a tribe. You actually have to join a tribe as you mature, right? Because what happens is, first of all, you're an infant, and then you have your parents to, to make a relationship with, but then when you move from your parents, you have your tribe, you have your group. Maybe it's the music you listen to, it's the gang you hang around with, whatever. You have to be socialized into the tribe. You have to, because otherwise you stay a dependent infant. Okay, but now you're socialized into the tribe. Well, is that where it ends? It's like, no. The next thing to do is differentiate yourself from the tribe while still knowing how to behave within the tribe. Well, that's the call to individualism. And that's, I think, what the West got right. Is we figured that out. It's like, you're more than your... You have to be a member of a group because otherwise you're not socialized. You're not good for anyone. You don't have to be able to play on a team, man. You have to have team loyalty. Okay, but that isn't where you should stop. You should take the next step and become a fully developed individual. And... See, the problem with being just a group member is that the group, it's the problem with conservatism. The group is a fixed entity. It has its rules and its regulations. And if you're a member, that's all you are. But the group can go badly wrong. So the group needs individuals to keep the group alive and revivified. So you have to become an individual so you can revivify the group. And that's the call, to, that's the call in the West to, to heroism, essentially, to noble way of living is to... Develop yourself past your group identity so that you can reconfigure the game when that becomes necessary. First, you're a child, then you're a member of a group, then you're an individual. It's like, get to the individual level. That's the solution. It's a solution to tribalism. But you have to accept responsibility to do that. If you treat someone with post-traumatic stress disorder, the, there's two things you have to do. You have to help them develop a very articulated philosophy of evil. Because otherwise their brain bothers them over and over and over. Why were you so naive? How did you become victimized? Why were you such a sucker? These are good questions. You don't want to have that happen to you again. You don't want to be exploited twice. Okay, so your eyes have to open up. We know this. God, we know how predators work with regards to children even. If you're a pedophilic predator and you're looking at a landscape of children, the child that you're going to go after is the one that's timid and won't fight back. You pick your victim. And predatory people in general are exactly like that, man. They're, because they're predators. They're not going to attack someone who's, who's going to fight back. In fact, the issue is likely not to even come up. They're going to be looking for someone, one way or another, that cannot conceptualize what they are. And then, perfect. It's, a, it's an open season, man. It's open season.